I'll be your moderator today. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Everyone that's joining this uh, this uh, panel session today is going to be talking about what's it like to be an Inuk in a STEM degree program. And so uh, in our audience, uh, we have the opportunity for you to be able to submit any questions in the chat function, either questions that you have about maybe I want to go into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and so we'll hear from each of these audience uh, panel members, what's it like for them? What do they do? Why do they do it? Are you nuts? Just kidding. And so <laughs> it's going to be a great session. And really, if you have questions, if you've been thinking about going into science, technology, engineering, or math, please submit your questions or your comments. So, uh, so many Inuit. Um, wow, there's some questions. Did being Inuk factor in your experience? experience as a science, technology, engineering, or math student or degree pursuer? That's a word. <laughs> Thanks so much once again. So today we have with us amazing people who are doing um, groundbreaking stuff. How many Inuit are actually in science, technology, engineering, or math? Well, here you go. There's already four. There's a lot more out there, but <laughs> you're groundbreakers. You're really leading the path for other Inuit. This can be done. Andrea Mary Anderson, who's standing behind our Haggat Inuit. We have Brian Pottle with an R I A N with. Here you gotta give away, Brian. Thank you, sir. We have Brian with a Y. Brian Vandenbrick. Gives a little wave, Brian Vandenbrick. Thank you, sir. And then lastly, but not least, Emily or Jane McCallum. Thanks so much for joining everyone. Okay, what a great topic because it's so important to see a lot more Inui going into STEM. But is it impossible? Is it hard? What are you doing? What? Why are you in this? So. Um, because I love seeing Andrea behind our Haggit in Yichadawit. Let's hear from Andrea. Hi, welcome. Share with the audience about a little bit who you are, what you're studying, and why. I'm Andrea. I live, uh, currently live in Yichadawit, Nunavut. I'm originally from Makovic in Nunatsiavut, and uh, I work as a physiotherapist at the hospital here. And um, I did a bachelor's degree and then also a master's in science. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's wonderful. A physiotherapist. Wow. Okay. I, I could use some physiotherapy. <laughs> All right, let's keep with the, uh, oh my gosh, Brian Pottle's amazing smile. Good morning, Brian. Please introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Pottle. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Postal in Rigolet in Nunatsiavut, uh, north coast of Labrador for anyone unfamiliar. Um, I'm uh, basically passionate about educating Indigenous youth uh, about the benefits of post-secondary education and have engaged in outreach work starting in 2013 with uh, the Memorial University of Newfoundland and their Aboriginal Ambassador Program uh, while I was still an undergrad actually. Um, and I graduated with a Bachelor of Engineering degree uh, in uh, 2015 uh, where I majored in electrical engineering and minored in physics. Uh, and, and nowadays I'm, uh, I'm working here in St. John's, uh, Newfoundland with uh, PAL Aerospace on their surveillance aircraft. And, and then before this, I had uh, lots of experience working with uh, radio frequency engineering, uh, wireless power transfer through, uh, through the air with uh, electromagnetic uh, waves and fields. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically where I am now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's stick with the Bryans and Brian with a Y, Mr. Vandenbrick. Thanks so much. Please introduce yourself. 
Hi, uh, it's, it's actually Van Brick. Uh, I'm Brian Van Brick. I work for Poland Off Canada at the Canadian Heart Research Station here in Cambridge Bay. Uh, I work here as a science ranger or senior field technician, but for the most part, I assist with various research projects. Uh, most of it includes currently work involving biodiversity, um, specifically with regard to insects, but we've also done work with uh, mold spores that are now in the atmosphere. But uh, my education background is I actually uh, didn't go right into STEM right away. Like for the most part, I actually uh, got to grade 11, quit, uh, started working. And when I was already like a young man, I was like 20, 27, when I went to the Royal Military College of Canada for the Aboriginal Leadership Opportunity Year. I did that for two years, then I released and uh, went back to work. But then I moved back up to Cambridge Bay uh, started working here at Polar in 2018, and uh, through work and Philip and Cybic, I've actually gotten into a Master's of Science uh, in Integrated Biology program at the University of Paul. But that's about it. Thanks so much, Brian Vandenbrick. Um, there is a bit of noise, I think, um, that's behind you, or maybe it's the room you're in. Um, if there's any way that we can we can really isolate your voice for the audience, uh, that would be fantastic. I'm not sure how to troubleshoot that, but um, Emily McCallum, please. Good morning. Um, hi. Um, I'm in high school, and. I just got accepted to Martin College for electrical engineering. And I'm very happy that I got asked to be put into this. And um, I I'm, I've been excited to kind of say my part of what it's like in the STEM, and I'm excited to hear everybody else's. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, so this is really cool. Emily's uh, just um, about to venture into uh, electrical engineering uh, at a college in, Al in Ontario. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. So we have a spectrum of people who are going or who are in uh, health sciences. We have electrical engineering. Uh, we have, uh, well, physics, my gosh, that's amazing. And uh, we have Brian Vandenbrick, who's uh, in biology and studying insects. Is that right? Insects in, in Nunavut. Um, that's funny because I think Inuit are generally running away from insects rather than studying insects. Okay, well, we'd love to hear more about that. Um, all right, so I think maybe, uh, how did you first get into STEM? Uh, and, you know, Inuit are generally uh, very, um, you know, even if you're a male or female or man or a woman, whatever we want to call it today, we all have this amazing ability to want to work with our hands. Um, you know, we're not just uh, or gatherers anymore. So what is this about uh, why you got into it? Um, yeah, was there someone who had influenced you on that? So let's start with that. That might be a good way to kind of create a conversation. What influenced you? Who influenced you? I know that Emily has a great, great story about that. Emily, you're just finishing high school, but someone really nudged you in this way. Could you please share that story? When I, some, I think someone who influenced me was in grade nine, I was put into the Queen's engineering uh, program for a week in the summer. And I think that's where it really interested me. And when I was also in physics this year, um, I, 
guess I got more interested into learning more about the electrical part. And I think it's something I want to go into. And um, I feel like it's something like not a lot of people are interested in, but um, I want I want to kind of explore everything. Exploring questions, the universe sounds like an amazing mind that you're growing. Um, I think you were in high school, you just finished. I think there was someone that was actually influencing you. Could you remind me and share with everyone who was this teacher and what was it that your teacher was saying? Um, I think it was my physics teacher who really inspired me and also uh, my grade nine and 11 English teacher, Miss Robertson. Um, she inspired me to go into what I wanted to go into. And um, I'm really happy that they taught me and uh, they also taught me to explore into everything and not just um, everything or like one subject. Thank you so much, Emily. Can we hear now from An Andrea, if, uh, if you don't mind? Uh, it's interesting enough, I actually started out in chemistry. Um, I knew I wanted to do something in the science because in like English and writing was not my strongest suit. Um, I did play sports growing up a lot um, on the north coast of Labrador. And I was thinking I took a chemistry online course because in high school, all of our courses were via distance learning. I didn't actually have a teacher because of just how remote the community was. Uh, so I took a chemistry course and that sparked my interest. So I was thinking I would like to do chemistry. I started off at Memorial University doing um, two years into a chem uh, undergrad. And I realized after my second year, that's not something that I really wanna pursue. Um, it hurt my brain. <laughs> I wasn't enjoying it. So I actually took a few other elective courses to try and figure out if I actually wanted to do a degree, if maybe I wanted to do a trade instead. Um, and I did have a sports background. So I took a um, intro to kinesiology course and I loved it. Um, so from there, I finished my degree in uh, kinesiology, which is the study of the body and how it moves. Um, and I think it was just how my brain um, likes to learn. I, it, it came easy to me and um, it was more interesting. And so I found that the things that I was more interested in learning, I actually enjoyed um, pursuing that as education. That is so cool. Uh, it's, it's how my brain likes to learn. That is so fantastic. I'm sorry, Andrea, did you, were you trying to add something else? Oh, I was just going to say that um, after a kinesiology degree, a lot of people just go and pursue more post-secondary education, whether it's in like public health, medicine, um, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, chiropractor. So after finishing that degree, then I had to decide uh, what I wanted to do after. Um, I could have worked as a kinesiologist, but um, there wasn't that much of a demand for it. And to be honest, the pay wasn't really that good. <laughs> so I wanted to actually go and pursue more education. And uh, I applied for a few programs and I got accepted into the physio program at Dalhousie in, in uh, Nova Scotia. And so I pursued that route because as a kid, I actually received physio um for my ankles and yeah I, I thought that was a great um route 
I, I think, uh, I think uh, she's experiencing technical difficulty difficulties. Uh, that might be because she's at the Sylvia Grinnell Park, um, partaking in some festivities. It looks like my internet connection is unstable. It might be an Iqaluit issue, so please, if I drop out, um, one of us will pick it up. But um, thank you. We're, I just love this conversation already. And really, I think kind of <clears throat> if there, if the point of this this um, discussion is to encourage other young Inuit to think about it. And I think we need to look no further than who we have here today, which is Emily. And I think Emily's getting a lot of rich information. I hope that we can get some comments from the audience. Uh, but this is so fantastic. Can I hear now before uh, Mr. Pottle kind of ends this round, Mr. Vandenbrick? Sure. I'm hoping... Uh... My audio is better now. Um, it's kind of funny because actually my chemistry professor at RMC actually like got me turned on to science as well. Um, he's like super animated. His name is Kami Parahani, but uh, in terms of teaching skills, he, he has incredible teaching skills. For the most part, I considered chemistry and a lot of science subjects to be pretty boring. Like I did well in them, but for the most part, it was just not interesting. Um, the cool thing about his class is his introduction to chemistry class. You got introduced to all the history involved in getting from where chemistry and a lot of actual science that we have today, like physics, um, from what it used to be 200, 300 years ago to now is incredible. Um, so yeah, that was super cool. It was my introduction to, to actual science as well. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Um, well, there's a great comment coming from the audience that I wanted to share with our panelists and everyone else who hasn't maybe seen it. I took a chemistry class as an elective in my first year of university, and oh man, did I ever make a mistake, lol. I love science, but chemistry gives me anxiety. Physics and neuroscience is much more enjoyable to me, lol. <laughs> well, thanks so much, audience member, who uh, who threw in that comment. So there's so many disciplines in science. Wow, technology, engineering, mathematics. So, Mr. Pottle, would love to hear kind of about who influenced you or why did you get into it. Is it because it's how my brain likes to learn? Thanks. So uh, it's it's funny because because. Uh, what, what Brian just touched on is was very poignant for me as well uh, with regards to um, the uh, the fact that uh, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it or you should necessarily pursue it as a degree um, and uh, it's uh, it's interesting because uh, I, I went into university with no idea what I wanted to pursue in life. And I uh, was just kind of haphazardly approaching it. Um, my parents had uh, kind of made me, uh, I guess, voluntold me to go into and, and university. The, the problem then became, what do I study? My dad told me that uh, one of his, uh, one of his like, good buddies growing up became an electrical engineer and designed some kind of security system. I got to travel the world uh, updating it. Uh, and whatnot, and it was, and that sent a really, uh, um, uh, th that was really quite an interesting experience uh, to, to kind of hear the second the second hand tale of somebody who kind of went on to to do something that was somewhat, I, I guess, remarkable. You know, I'm from I'm from a small community that had roughly you know 250, uh, 350 uh, population. And uh, to have to know of somebody, uh, even through my dad, like his dad, my dad's friend, who had traveled the world to uh, do this, uh, to to implement a system, it just sounded remarkable. So I figured, okay, without putting too much effort in, I'm going to say engineering. And at the time, I had a pretty good um, understanding of computers, so I was like, hey, computer engineering. I got into it realized I don't really want to program for the rest of my life. Uh, I, I'm, and I was good at it. 
I did okay. I, I got like uh, like uh, really good grades, but I didn't enjoy it. So what Brian touched on is really huge because I realized um, before it was too late that I didn't want to go down this route. And so I actually switched uh, from computer engineering, which was heavily you know, about programming, um, to uh, electrical engineering, which was really focused on uh, math and uh, math and physics, and uh, and and also you know electromagnetism, and uh, that was uh, really a, a huge uh, attractor for me. Um, it wasn't it wasn't easy. Um, I you know, this, this is thing, you know, imposter syndrome. Uh, it's, it was very real for me. Uh, I had very few, you know, indigenous fellow indigenous classmates. I had lots of people from across the globe. I had friends who were from China, friends from India, Bangladesh, wherever, but it, it struck me that there was a very small representation of indigenous people in the engineering field. And, uh, I, I'd actually, um, through my practical hands-on work terms, had actually encountered some hostility from um, from non-indigenous engineers towards the indigenous population they worked uh, with. The person at the time, my coworker, didn't realize I was indigenous, so he was being a lot more candid, I suppose, than he would normally have been. Um, and that all kind of really reinforced this 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 weird sense of: Do I really belong in this field? Do I should I really be pursuing this? Is this for me? Is this what I'm meant to do? And it was only through kind of uh, digging through my own past trauma, you know, I'd grown up, uh, and, and this is, I guess, a bit of a trigger warning, I suppose, uh, being subjected to, you know, domestic violence in the household, alcoholism. Um, during the program, I'd actually lost my, my brother to to suicide, unfortunately. And, and dealing with all of these things was very, uh, uh, was really difficult because I know for a fact with my classmates, it was not a typical experience. And so I found myself wondering, am I too damaged to pursue this field? And, and dealing with all of these, uh, all of these feelings, um, I, I kind of overcame it with, you know, realizing where my strong suits lie. I, I, um, well, I'm able to make the sense of the world through the equations I was studying in physics or engineering. And so I, I kind of found a, a sort of sanity, I suppose, in, in my studies. Brian, thank you so much. Um, oh my gosh, um, just sharing a very personal, thank you about sharing um, about your brother's suicide. Um, this just tells me that as Inuit, even if we are privileged to go to university, go to college, even trying to take up and succeeding in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We all come from a history of intergenerational trauma. And uh, it's really um, something that we can't forget. And, uh, you know, even with all of our history and with all of the current intergenerational trauma issues, identity, belonging, um, we still are brave enough to enter into subjects that maybe, I think Brian, um, Brian Pottle, uh, you brought this out uh, in our last conversation about how science, um, because of all of these kinds of issues as Inuit, I want to just if you don't mind, panelists, if I can ask Brian Pottle to just um, carry on that little conversation we had. Um, you shared with us about your brother's uh, untimely passing. Uh, what did science do for you? Um, if you recall our conversation on that. I, I definitely uh, recall it for sure, because it's, it's something that rings true uh, through every facet of my life, I think. During the times of of you know those incredible um, incredibly challenging times, I found myself you know in a in a, a big state of disarray. I couldn't. I had a hard time understanding you know why my brother would have would have done these things, and uh, and the world just. I had a hard time making sense of a lot of things, but what I I was drawn to, what I realized, is that life made sense when 
you were studying science, when you're studying mathematics, physics, these all, all of these things, they, uh, they are truisms that are true irrespective of the chaos in your life. And so through, through science, I found, I found clarity. You know, I, I found a way of, of realizing that even though things aren't okay now, they, they, they will be okay eventually. And the fact that these equations exist are kind of, kind of speak to that. I, I, and that's kind of what I took away from that. That is incredible how science um, and all of the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is a place where everything makes sense. There are truisms. It is, it is the truth when even as uh, us living as Inuit with our histories um, of chaos and, and trauma and, uh, and making sense of this world, um, you can find a place that makes sense through science. So what an amazing contribution to this conversation today. Um, it's about 11.58 and we have uh, exactly two minutes and uh, everyone has contributed so much and uh, we're lucky enough to get Andrea back. Um, so if you, re oh, we have until 12.30. My gosh, we got lots of time. I'm sorry, it's been a crazy couple of days for me. So, wow, we have, we can really, create an awesome conversation. So please, everyone, you just heard Brian Pottle share a little bit about how science makes sense in a world of chaos. Would anybody like to pick up on that conversation and continue it because it's so profound? Um. Andrea here, sorry, my phone died because it was so cold outside, so I ran home really quick. <laughs> um, see, I agree with what Brian says, um, but I also would like to say in my um, field of science, it makes, it does make sense because I, my, um, profession is about the human body and how it works and there is only I mean there is a mystery when things go wrong and you're trying to figure out why it's going wrong which is what I really like because you're always trying to solve a puzzle and why is why is this happening why is this happening um, and trying to put the pieces together to help um, a patient uh, but in um, my field of learning, um, the body is what the body is. There is no, well, it is all theory, I do have to say. I mean, you don't really know, but um, yeah, I do agree. Um, but then I also have to say that in my field of study, there is like, uh, the body, I, I don't know how to say it. Like, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to know that different parts of um, STEM um, have different theories and different, um, yeah, different ways of learning and teaching, which I think is really important for um, people to understand if they're interested in this field because it's a whole broad of thing. Like I don't, um, like in regards to, physics and math, it's not my best forte, um, but in regards to how the body works and and the medical field side of it, that's where my interest is, yeah. So that's all I have to say for that. Thanks so much. Um, yes, the human body. Um, so the universe is a mis place of mystery. The body can be a place of mystery when you're diagnosing. Um, and so, yes, um, Inuit um, are not always getting into decolonizing issues, but sometimes Inuit are interested in getting into science, technology, um, engineering, and math. Um, and so, but there's this new other 
component um, to the conversation or the discipline around STEM, and that would be STEAM. Uh, STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And what it does here is includes the idea that in indigenous worldview, um, that there are aspects that we um, need to consider more holistically. Um, because, because the world is not just um, black and white, um, as much as Brian Pottle enjoys that part. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. But there's an amazing conversation that, that we can maybe get into for a few minutes around STEAM. Um, there's a comment from the audience, which is so important. And I think, I, I think we can transition now. Uh, we have time. Um, let's think about our own uh, Inuit identity, our worldview. So a comment from the audience. Inuit traditional knowledge in engineering and science. Our, our Inuit ancestors were great engineers. For example, the Atunga stitch when making kamiks. Needle makes three moves and thread sinew is unseen. Now, isn't that absolutely amazing? Um, you can't even see the stitch. So thank you to the audience member who, who, who wanted to make sure that let's incorporate the aspect of indigenous uh, Inuit traditional knowledge. I've been arguing a little bit about um, and trying to disrupt the conversation around science as being superior. I was just fooling with the, the whole conversation with them because I was saying, well, Inuit, no science. And uh, so some real sticklers in the traditional sciences were saying, well, no, 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 that's just traditional knowledge. And so that's for another day. Anyway, what about this, this aspect of uh, this new direction or this inclusion of the arts in, in STEAM or any traditional knowledge in engineering and science? We can, we can uh, look to the obvious inventions and innovation we've had as Inuit, Iglubigap, Haya, etc. So, does anyone want to chime in here? Brian Vandenbrick is working at Polar yes. Knowledge Canada, and so, yes. uh, so he's uh, working. With actually, please. Go ahead. you're cutting in and out. Okay, cool. Uh, it was a bit choppy there for a second. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, so. Traditional knowledge, actually, I just had a discussion with one of my um, supervisors uh, during a lab meeting, basically, for one of the courses that I'm taking. But um, I think the gist of the conversation that we had was basically that I am currently looking at the diversity or biodiversity of insects. And the thing with that that I'm trying to figure out is here in Cambridge Bay, at least recently, it was reported in the news that we had a wood wasp vector, which uh, would be an invasive species or rather uh, an insect that is not necessarily supposed to be here in Cambridge Bay. So that's the kind of subject that I'm looking into, which is uh, incursions or the range expansion of insects um, further north, or in the case of the wood boss, potentially invasive species of insects. So the thing with traditional knowledge is um, in science, like everybody, for the most part, kind of like views it as its own separate thing and it's not science, but it's, it's science, it's just in a different, um, it's just in a different format. It's like if you had somebody building a house, you have people describing a house, how it works, and how they relate to it. Um, but your carpenter or your plumber don't want to talk to each other because they don't view each other as equals. And if you have any traditional knowledge that's there and it's actually relevant, um, and it applies to what you're talking about, which is, as they were talking about, um, caribou or muskox, there's kind of a perception that observations that anyone make in some streams of science aren't valid um, because they fall more in lines with history and uh, traditional knowledge. But if you look back just to something very recently with the search for the, the, the Franklin, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that Inuit traditional knowledge is based on actual fact. Um, just because it's Inuit that are reporting it uh, doesn't change the fact that it's actually real. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my point, I guess. 
That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, invasive species, um, Inuit knowledge. Um, we'd love to hear from Emily soon, but Andrea, or Andrea, sorry. I have a friend named Andrea, so please, please chime in. She can go first. It's okay. You sure? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Emily McCallum, listen, you've been hearing quite a lot for a few minutes. You're just coming out of high school. You're going into college, um, electrical engineering. You know, you, you made it, you're going to give it a shot. But um, so what have, what have you been thinking about, you know, what you've heard so far? Have you gathered any thoughts that you need to share? Um, it's a lot that I've heard and I've taken that in. And I find it, it's early to kind of choose what you want to go into at 17. And, um, but, um, I'm kind of just like hoping to, to just see where going into the STEM takes me and um, it's just something I find interesting and like hearing what other people are saying about it, it very, it's very interesting. And I, it's, I find in what courses I've taken in high school, there's a lot of, I find a lot of guys in the class and not a lot of girls. And I just want to take a different path than like what other people are taking. And I kind of want to take my own path and see where it takes me. Thank you. That's so, yeah, you find everything so interesting. I think that's kind of what the commonality here is everyone in everyone getting into STEM or STEAM. I'm just interested in everything. So that's so fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Andrea of Inakalawit. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to first uh, touch base on the point of the arts aspect. Um, in our culture, um, and I'm just going to relate this to the human body. Uh, you know, it, we're very well, very skilled in creating garments that were biomechanically friendly. So when I say biomechanical, it's um, the physics of how the body works and how much forces you act on to different things. And traditionally, um, the clothing that we wore were made to have an advantage. Um, in just for an example, um, a gummick. Um, those type of shoes create less ground reaction forces up into our bones because you're not having that much impact going um, when you hit the ground, when your heel strikes the ground. And kids, like when kids grow up and as they age, it's very important that they build the small intrinsic muscles of the foot. And that's what the gummick does. Like kids should not be wearing shoes at least until they're two or three years, until they build that arch support that allows them to run. Um, and Inuit already knew this, they have gummick, like it, it already created that, um, foundation for our bones to be, um, strong. And the other thing is the amauti and the, the seamstresses of how they sew in certain parts of the amauti actually made it more comfortable and less stress on the low back for women when they were carrying their children versus the modern 
the um, baby carriers that they have in the front or on the back. Um, and in like this is just traditional knowledge that they used in the art. So they're using art, which is sewing, creating, but there is the biomechanical aspect towards it. Um, and I really like that. And there's not much research on it. Um, and in regards to like uh, building with your hands, I mean, Inuit built a homotic. And as you know, throughout each region, um, the homotic is built different because they adapted to the environment, whether there was trees or no trees, hills, no hills, the, the way you tie on your nut books, like those are all different based on the regions. And it just shows how the knowledge is there across Canada, but we just adapt to how it is. And um, I think that's just really like in interesting and exciting to know that you're a part of a culture that does this. Um, and I guess just as an example, like I, I started off at the um, the Khakik today, and that is the huge igloo that people gather at. So you're having the techno, like the 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 physics, the engineering of how to build that for a much a, a huge group of people, but then it's an art festival as well. So they're coming together and I I really uh, like that. That's why I wanted to show it today. Um, and I guess the other thing too is around um, things for our health, like for example, the sunglasses and um, using different things for like sunscreen and stuff. So I, I just really like to point out that we are a culture that can adapt to the environment um, through STEM. So yeah, I yes, am, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I, am, I am incredibly blown away. Like, uh, if you ever put on a talk in the Kalawit about that, oh my gosh, if you could write an article for Nunatsiak News, oh my gosh, do a PhD on it. Oh my gosh, that is so, even a, even a National Geographic episode. Well, so I heard fantastic. about the I heard about the new funding for um, students that the thing that happened yesterday. So a PhD might be might be in the thoughts. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> oh my God, I could just imagine Richard Attenborough speaking in his English accent, talking through the science of Inuit. <laughs> I'm sorry. But that was amazing. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. It's like, keep going. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, um, we have to incorporate what a few people are, are um, uh, talking about in the chat. Okay. We have a question for Brian with a Y. Brian with a Y, specifically. Hmm. Okay. Hello from Joe Haven. We have a question here. What made you want to study insects? <laughs> sure. Uh, so funnily enough, actually, interestingly, it's possible that we might be doing some insect collection samples in uh, Joe Haven this summer. We'll see what happens. Um, if you know anybody interested in assisting us collecting uh, insect samples, it would be great. Um, but what, honestly, I'm not that interested in insects. Um, it is a super fascinating subject, but I just fell into it through work. Um, for the most part, I have been collecting insects for the last uh, two, two, three years now um, with polar, uh, mostly in the summer field season, because obviously it's that there aren't any bugs, thankfully, in the, in the winter. Uh, but yeah, um, they're interesting on their own, but the interest that I have in insects basically is on a larger scale, which is um, in the subject of biology, you have this concept of primary succession, secondary succession, and all these things that happen as um, an environment is changing um, for the most part. Like I believe the uh, glaciers in Greenland are, are melting and are exposing lots of bare rock and the interesting stuff about that is one of the things I think I was talking to someone about was the possibility that it's it's actually really small insects that are colonizing 
the bugs with the precursor stuff or lichen. And the lichen eventually um, grows to the extent that you're actually able to support other forms of life, like caribou or muskox or uh, caribou. Uh, caribou definitely eat muskox, or actually, no. caribou definitely eat lichen. I don't know if muskox eat lichen. It's not in the subject that I'm too familiar with. But that's the concept that I, I find interesting. It's just fascinating how these relationships exist between um, insects and larger forms of life um, all the way up to us. And it's super interesting. Um, and IQ and traditional knowledge and um, other Inuit are just super great uh, reservoirs of all this knowledge that needs to be captured because it's important, um, especially as climate change is happening. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Everyone uh, is demonstrating an incredible um, array of thinking, uh, thinking styles, um, curiosity, exploration. Um, it's about 1218. That gives us about 12 minutes. There are four panelists. I'm wondering if we can do one final round for the benefit of young people, young Inuit, who are maybe even haven't considered um, going into science, technology, engineering, arts, or math. But I think this is a great opportunity to end it in a way that, uh, that tells people what maybe the possible careers are. Andre, you talked about how health sciences and health careers, there was lots that you were kind of talking about. Um, and, and so, um, you know, what, what can you be when you grow up if you get into science, technology, and engineering, and math? Um, you've heard a lot of great examples, but let's use this last round uh, to use uh, to, to, to see if we can kind of make other young Inuit or Inuit interested in encouraging their kids or young people to go into this or use this opportunity as well to end your remarks on whatever else or whatever other aspects you wanted to share with everyone. And so we have the luxury of 11 minutes. And so you have about three minutes per person. Uh, please take your time. Thank you. I'd like to go to Brian Pottle because uh, we haven't heard his lovely voice in a while. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so, uh, so what's really interesting about being in, a, in, in the kind of STEM or, or seeing fields is that we actually have an exceedingly unique background that allows for the creation of, of things uh, you know, through say engineering or what have you that are truly unique. Uh, and so you actually have an opportunity to create your own field of, of research. Even it's, it's actually the, there just are no limits as to what we can achieve these days. The biggest thing that I had to combat with, I think was just believing in yourself that you can do these things. Um, I found that a lot of my peers already had this belief instilled in them for maybe ever since they're children, because say in my case, I had engineering uh, classmates, their parents or aunts or uncles were all engineers. So they had uh, a, a kind of tried and true pattern of people following in this field. So they didn't have any kind of the uncertainty that I uh, experienced with. Um, but even with engineering, um, it's really, it's funny, Andrea, you commented on how uh, there's some things you grapple with uh, problems that you just have to figure out, like the pieces are there, but sometimes there is a bit of mystery. And, and actually, that's one of the, the biggest things that I enjoy about engineering is, is the troubleshooting aspect. Um, and, and, and a big part of that comes from my, uh, my, my cultural identity, you know, being Inuk. Uh, growing up, um, and, and I'm sure everybody here can relate, in, in a small community, um, there is this mentality that if something needs to get done, you can do it. And in fact, you, you have to do it because there's nobody else who's going to help you. You can't go to a, a garage like out here in St. John's or wherever else. You have to be able to do these things. And so there's this yes, I can do it attitude, which was is tremendous when it comes to solving problems that you encounter in, in any of the, the STEM fields. Um, and even with artistry as well, um, to design something um, like, say, this robot 
there is some art in it, right? Uh, so like you have to lay it all out, the circuit boards, you have to design how everything interconnects. And so artistry um, can actually be melded in really cool ways with, uh, with science. And so basically to anybody who is looking at pursuing any of these fields, um, I would say that, that now is the time to do it. Uh, and, and you can absolutely do it if you put your mind to it. I know it's cliched, but it's actually true. <laughs> For sure. Oh my gosh! Um, I hope to to uh, be able to chat with you uh, face to face one day. Yeah. Wonderful! Your interventions are, are are super super awesome. Thank you. Um, well, um, let's see. I think it's time to go to Emily McCallum. Um. I think, like, um, there's something that I find interesting is that um, it's kind of different, and um, it's something that not a lot of people go into. I mean, when I first was in high school, I wanted to go into architecture, but when I took chemistry, or when I was in science in grade nine, and I took chemistry, I found that interesting more than, um, I guess, anything else I took. And that kind of stuck with me. And through the four years, um, I got more and more interested into looking more into the sciences and math. And I think you should really explore everything through high school. And if there's something you don't really like, then you can choose something else. And I guess you could, it's something to think about. And um, through grade nine and 10, I really wanted to go into either architecture or computer engineering, but once it came to grade 11 and 12, I kind of got more interested into the STEM and I kind of wish I was interested in it in my earlier years, but it's something to think about. Thanks so much, Emily, for joining us today. That's wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to give uh, Brian Vanbrick uh, another go, and then we'll end it with uh, Andrea, if we could. Thanks so much. Sure. Uh, I've already forgotten a question, but I'm assuming it's related to what potential interest we should have in STEM or uh, future students of STEM. Um, the interesting part is there's actually lots of applications for any of involvement. Um, I can think of off just interactions that I've had with people or interactions I've had with the home that I'm living in, uh, or renting rather. It's, it's, it's basic as things like doors. Like if you can build a better door that's actually designed for the Arctic that doesn't ice up, you're probably on the right track because the amount of doors that are you know, freezing, becoming hard to close up here in Cambridge Bay is, is slightly ridiculous, especially with the weather that we're currently having. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast, but. Um, Brian Pottle can probably speak to this and the fact that uh, aerospace engineering, they solved this back in the 1940s with like inflatable uh, leading edges of wings. Like, why well, can't we have that for doors? It'd be perfect. And then all of our doors would not become ridiculous and hard to close all the time, just like the de ice in the right hand But um, yeah, stuff like that. Like, there's lots of applications where Inuit show a lot of ingenuity. Um, just naturally solving problems, like the whole thing of comatics is, I, I don't know if it's also the same in every other community, but the introduction of plastic running boards um, 
is a really good example because previous to that it was just just wood, frozen ice, or you know, steel, and it's moved over to high density polyethylene or plastic, um, which glides over ice and snow much smoother than that used to, and that's literally a recent adaptation to the construction of sleds, which is incredible. It's, you can move lots of cargo or people quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Brian. Well, it's making me think of, and I'm just going to throw it out there, but when we're on a hamotik and we're going along the sea ice, it can get, or even along the nuna, it can get pretty bumpy. So I was thinking about um, 18 wheelers. You know how comfortable those seats are? Air, air, I don't know. So I thought maybe, you know, we could put some sort of system on the hamuti, right? No, you're laughing. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get um, the Canada Research Council up here. <laughs> Andrea, thank you so much. Yeah, couple of minutes, please. Um, end us on a non-funny note, or a funny note. I think she's uh, either she's really good at not moving or she's frozen out. Oh, there she is. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I it froze for a second. Uh, I think my last uh, remark would be anyone who's interested in STEM is first look at the big picture. Um, and look at what type of life you're actually wanting to see yourself in when you are finished um, post-secondary education um, in regards to do you want a nine to five job, want to work shift work, are you wanting to work in a remote camp, are you wanting to work in a more research um, type setting, um, are you wanting to be more of an office job or are you wanting to be more hands-on. So those are things that um, can help you decide on what type of program you would like um, and where you actually want to live when you're done school too because um, are you wanting to live more in a rural versus an urban cent uh, urban setting set uh, urban setting because uh, depending on what type of job you are wanting you might not be able to live in a rural place. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for Inuit to pursue post-secondary education in um, like the mining or in health centers or at the clinics. Um, and a lot of roles, like big roles that Inuit can play a real um, tangible role in and not just like entry level positions, actually like manager higher up. And that's what I would love to see. I would love to see less transient workers, especially um, in Nunavut and actually having other Inuk, like having another Inuk person to work with, um, that would be so awesome. Because <laughs> um, it's lonely, I mean, I, like, I do work with um, Inuit people, but not at the same level. And I want people to be with me working so that I can bounce ideas off as well. So I'm so excited that there are more young people wanting to be in the STEM, STEM program. Um, and yeah, I think just understanding and trying to figure out and learn for yourself what type, where you see yourself in five years, 10 years. And I do want to say it's not going to be easy. Um, sciences, math, engineering, any technology program, it's hard. It's very hard work. And a lot of times you might be the only Inuk in the program, which is another thing added on top of being um, away from home for school. But I always just think about when times got hard that what is your end goal and why are you doing this? And you're only going to be gone away from home for so many years. And like, it's only four years out of your entire life. Um, enjoy it. You will be homesick, but just learn 
just be proud of where you came from and try to incorporate that into your learning as well. And just thinking back to thinking back to like our ancestors and our culture and how far we've come and how there's so much opportunity that we have now. So and those are my last remarks. I think you've captured them for everyone. Thank you so much. Andrea Anderson, Brian Pottle, Brian Vandenberg, Emily McCallum, you've been amazing. This conversation, I cannot thank you enough. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I hope you did, those in the audience. I hope you get to meet these folks. I'm so proud of them. Um, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you. And uh, please enjoy the rest of the gathering. Um, we're done. We're two minutes over. I apologize. Take care, everyone. And I hope to see you.